Well, again, let me welcome everyone to this uh, afternoon conversation on the subject of writing lives. I shall be the host, the moderator, the interrupter, if necessary, Ira Nadell. Uh, our guests this afternoon are Cheryl Grace, English, Nedja Genu from English and the Institute for Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Social Justice, and Phil Resnick. Um, emeritus from political science and a poet. Uh, I want to take this time to acknowledge that uh, UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And I would also like to acknowledge that you are joining us today from many places, both near and far, and acknowledge that the traditional owners and caretakers are the Musqueam of these lands. I also would like to note that the event is being recorded for archival purposes and it will be posted on the website of the Emeritus College and you will receive a link uh, to it after it has been posted. The format that we're going to use this afternoon is that each of the three speakers will have about eight minutes to talk about their work, a little bit about themselves, how they came to write the kind of work that they have. Um, I should say that my own interest has been biography for quite a number of years now. And I have in fact uh, written lives of Leonard Cohn and Tom Stoppard, David Mamet, and in fact, I have a new uh, biography coming out in the spring on Philip Roth. So that's a long story, but for another time. So at this point, I would like to introduce um, our first uh, speaker who is Professor Cheryl Grace. Cheryl's had a remarkable career um, centered around Canadian culture, Canadian literature, Canadian drama. Uh, among her very important titles are Canada and the Idea of the North and another Inventing Tom Thompson. She's also previously written a biography of the dramatist Sharon Pollock. She is a UBC Distinguished University Scholar and in fact, um, has received the title of University Killam Professor. Um, Cheryl's most recent title and important book, which has just been published, is about the traumatist uh, Timothy Finley. It's entitled Tiff, A Life of Timothy Finley. I'd like to invite Cheryl to take over for eight minutes. Thank you, Ira. It's great fun to, to be here and to be able to do this despite the pandemic. So all is well and people are paying attention, it's great. For those of you who don't know anything or very much about Timothy Finley, let me begin by uh, explaining that uh, Finley was born uh, in, in Toronto in 1930 and he died in 2002 before he could complete much of the work he had still planned to write. His accomplishments were outstanding and varied from award-winning novels and plays to short stories and autobiography. Among his best known works are this, The Wars, published in 1977. It's an iconic novel, uh, considered one of the greatest in the English language to deal with the uh, Great War, the First World War. But he would go on to write many other things, the novel Not Wanted on the Voyage. I think his masterpiece, his famous last words, and Headhunter, etc., and important plays, including Elizabeth Rex and Stillborn Lover. I'm not going to discuss any of these works in any detail today, unless it comes up in questions, in which case I'm happy to. Our topic today is life writing. I want to say a few words, therefore, about the how and the why I wrote Timothy Finley's biography called Tiff, A Life of Timothy Finley. First, the why. And there are many reasons. Here are just a few. He's an excellent writer. 
uh, at his best, a, a superb writer, an important writer. And you know, that's enough, it seems to me, to warrant serious uh, attention and a biography. But that's not all. He was a central artist and public intellectual in Canadian late 20th century cultural history. He played a lot of roles in that regard, um, not least the uh, Writers' Union of Canada formation. He was a uh, founding member. But the third reason is maybe the most important. I hadn't thought it was when I first started, and that is that his messages and his vision are highly relevant right now for us, sadly. He opposed censorship, bigotry, fascist thinking, climate change, though he wouldn't have called it climate change or global warming. And he warned us about plagues. His relevance, it seems to me, has become increasingly important as time passes. Young students that I taught Finley, for, which I, for whom I taught Finley, resonated with him, recognized his importance, and that was a that was a, a cue right there for me to get busy and do more with his life. Okay, how does a biographer or do I as a biographer approach the craft of biography? First and last, I believe a biographer must tell a story. He or she must shape a life into a story. That story must honor the facts as well as avoiding speculating or speculation. A biographer must admit that there are things she cannot know and she must never read the life in a literary biography back into the life. My task, and it lasted over 10 years, my task required three types of research in my adventure with Timothy Finley. I did field work, as I call it. I had to go to archives and I did interviews. First, the field work. For Finley, I had to go where he had gone, in Canada, the United States, England, France, Italy, Germany. But one place was and remains always, I think, absolutely essential to my search for Finley because it was essential to his life. And that place was a farm north of Toronto that he christened Stone Orchard with a nod of the head to check off the cherry orchard, but it has other meanings as well. This farm dates back, it's still there, it dates back to the 1830s. And he and his partner, Bill Whitehead, founded in the early 60s, moved in with a whole menagerie of cats they'd rescued, dogs they'd rescued, and eventually horses they would res rescue from the glue factory. They lived there for over 30 years and Finley did almost all of his writing while living at Stone Orchard. He could find peace there. He walked the fields there and many aspects of that farmhouse, the animals and the 50 acres of land were going to find their way transformed into his writing. Next, the archives. Well, the archives proved to be far more cha challenging than I'd expected. Uh, I've worked in archives since I was a graduate student. I love it but this was something else. Finley kept private journals from his teens to a few weeks before he died. There are thousands of handwritten, unpaginated journal pages. His main fond is at Library Archives Canada where I spent many weeks in the restricted reading room, reading these pages. Thank God his his handwriting is better than other writers on whom I've worked. And these journals illuminated the private man in astonishing ways. I could follow him through his years as an actor in England in the mid fifties to the moment when he realized he was a writer with a Canadian voice and not an actor. That was one of those aha moments they are amazing moments. Because then I was able to follow his long struggle to achieve literary success, which of course he did. The third category of work 
is interviewing. And this is also essential. And I conducted a great many interviews. However, there were a few people who refused to speak to me and that was their prerogative. And there were others who died before I could get to them before I began my research. I'll name just three famous people. The great Alec Guinness, the British actor. William Hutt, the great Canadian actor. And ultimately then the incomparable Margaret Lawrence. Lawrence and Finley became very, very close friends. And that's just three of the people I missed out on catching. From this research, I got facts and insights. My task then was to make a story of Tiff come alive, make him come alive. So Tiff, A Life of Timothy Finley, it's a big one, <laughs> came out from Wilfrid Laurier Press uh, earlier this fall. And it's available in bookstores or on Amazon Go to your local bookstore if you can. And it's my hope that Tiff, and that is a nickname that his family gave him and his friends used, my hope is that he does come alive through all his despairs, travails, accomplishments in the story I tell. In the final analysis, and there's a lot of trauma and unhappiness and struggle in Timothy Finley's life, in the final analysis, I believe his story is both a love story and a success story. His motto was, and I quote, hope against despair. Often written in letters scattered everywhere in those private journals, hope against despair. And he lived by that motto. And I'm going to stop there, Ivan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cheryl. I think you've really identified the challenges in writing a biography. And certainly one of the most positive things that you identified was the archive, but that's also, and it can be in a positive sense of burden because there is so much material. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Sneja Ganu, who has been working uh, in the area of multicultural and post-colonial and feminist uh, critical history and theory. Um, she has been the director of the Center for Research in uh, women, uh, Women's and Gender Studies at UBC. She's also for a number of years been the North American editor of feminist theory. Her focus seems to have evolved to the question of uh, multiculturalism, literary interpretation, uh, she's also done research on ethnic minority writings. Among the titles of the books that she has published, we have Haunted Nations, Colonial Dimensions of Multiculturalism. And her forthcoming book, I believe, is titled Back to the Future, Post-Multiculturalism, Imminent Cosmopolitanism. And this afternoon, she's going to address the question of refugee and immigrant uh, narratives with particular reference to Beru's Buchani. So, Sneja. Thank you, Ira. In fact, that book did come out a couple of years ago and it had a different title, but never mind. Let's get on to Beru's Buchani, <laughs> um, <laughs> who has become, but I want him to become even more famous, has become well known. He's a Kurdish journalist who was educated and worked in Iran but because he uh, promoted Kur Kurdish language and literature uh, and culture, it was not safe for him to stay there. And in an attempt to gain asylum in Australia, just as the boat he was on sank, he was intercepted by Australian authorities and along with many others was imprisoned on Manus Island. Mm -hmm. And this was part of Australia's offshore facilities that set up, were set up to discourage future asylum seekers and it involved the outsourcing of its water politics. Buchani was incarcerated there from 2013 to 2017 when the prison was shut down. However, he was forced to remain on the island until 2019 when he was moved to Port Moresby. During the period of incarceration, he published an account of his own experiences and of those that were part of his community. So it's a different way of writing lives. 
that I'm celebrating here. His book is called No Friend But the Mountain, written from Manus Prison, and it was published in 2017. It was smuggled out via illicit phone, cell phones through more than a thousand WhatsApp messages, text by tiny text. There were many interruptions to this precarious progress. The texts were forwarded to his translators um, and once published received worldwide acclaim as well as numerous prizes in Australia, although there were some who said he was not uh, eligible in fact to uh, receive prizes because of course Australia had stopped him from coming. As the foreword states, the book is a collaborative effort. It's also a visceral indictment of Australia's border policies and resonates for those who like myself, the child of refugees uh, whose parents came over and as displaced persons or DPs as they were known. And his account of confinement of course strikes a chord with all of us at the moment. In his review of the book, uh, the Canadian writer Lawrence Hill, who's been instrumental in educating Canadians about the presence of slavery within Canada, think of his book, The Book of Negroes. He situated the book in relation to prison writings such as those of Anne Frank, uh, Malcolm X, um, Alexander Zolzhenitsyn's account of the Soviet gulags, there are many others. There's also a growing literature of refugee tales, and that's what I've researched for many decades. The contemporary accounts since such forced migrations have extended over centuries. To quote Stuart Hall, these accounts document the struggle to come into representation. And in this instance, the state sanctioned violence is laid very publicly at Australia's door and helps remind one that Australia became, began life as a settler, it began its life as a settler colony that was also a penal colony dedicated to incarceration. Buchani's book is hard to classify in terms of genre because uh, whilst it's a minutely parsed account of how people survive in the face of forms of deprivation and torture, it does so by mixing poetry with realist depictions of events as well as typologies of personalities reminiscent of much earlier literature. So you think, for example, of uh, Chaucer and his pilgrims. Um, Buchani gives us types who are so, to some degree streamlined embodiments of their dominant traits. So their names, the penguin, the kadaba, the cow, signal both their group identity and their elusive individualism. There are those who command respect and constantly remind the beleaguered community that they are human. But as in the case of Reza Bharati, they are also sacrificial. Reminder of Judith Butler's harrowing question, whose lives are grievable? The only characters who are named in Buchani's account are two who died. The figures are composites to some degree that is to protect their identities. Buchani's book begins with the boat trip and it's an agonizing beginning to the ordeal with him barely surviving the sea when he is rescued onto the warship. As he says, I feel like a small animal caught in the talons of a skilled hunter. It, in the unseaworthy boat prior to that, Buchani observes the various groups of refugees and documents their strategies for surviving the likelihood of death at any moment. And some do die on that journey. Hope rises in the motley group once they are rescued by the Australian warship. As one of the poems scattered throughout states, I quote, all over the deck of that warship sit human beings. They are human beings who still wear the scars of dying the scars from when death clawed at their faces. They sit passively on the deck, but they are happy. So those hopes are thoroughly destroyed when they are just transported to Manus via Christmas Island. The women and children are diverted to the island nation of Nauru, where some of them still reside. The men are all transported to Manus Island, Papua New Guinea. So, a dominant strategy for survival for Bachani is to assume that there is a malign plan undergirding the torture as he analyzes the intersectional systems of oppression that operate in the prison complex. The schema he uses is one coined by the feminist theologian Elizabeth Fiorenzo Schusler called the Kiriaki system, designed to break down the prisoner's humanity. To quote, those imprisoned on Manus are themselves sacrificial subjects of violence. 
we are a bunch of ordinary humans locked up for simply seeking refuge. Thus, arbitrarily, uh, thus arbitrary rules proliferate as does starvation and the withholding of medical care. What helps them survive is to form tentative alliances with the Papus, the Manutians employed within the prison as part of the agreement with the Australian government. The Papus themselves have no decision-making powers and have been told that the prisoners are dangerous terrorists simply because they come from Iran, Iraq, and Kurdistan. The communities the prisoners subsequently forge among themselves are based on language and other ethnic considerations, but those who can't join on those bases are even more alienated. So, for example, in Chapter 5, there's someone called the stateless Rohingya boy, who is excluded even from the excluded. Beyond that, Buchani observes the types such restless, uh, relentless oppression engenders, the cow, who is at the front of the queue formed for meals, where those at the back often find nothing. Or there is the whore who performs spirited transgender theatrics that resonate with the prisoners who forget their troubles in the songs and dances associated with traditional festivities. And part of the satisfaction includes the anxieties these performances provoke in the stony-faced Australian guards. Another important strategy is to find tiny oases of solitude and isolation near, for example, the fetid toilet block that has paradoxically spawned many flowers. At night in particular, these moments enable the imagination to take flight and to revisit the homeland and the mountains associated with the, with the Kurds. Do the Kurds have any friend but the mountains, asked Buchani. Recognized by indigenous groups across the world, the Kurds are themselves stateless and stretch across Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and Syria. The book comprises fragments of life, of cultural traditions, languages, inaccessible to readers, hidden particularly under the poetry. And I'll cite towards the end. I must confess, says Buchani, that I don't know who I am and what I will become. I have interpreted my whole past over and over again. Parts of my past have been unlocked as a result of the death of my loved ones. And in addition, other parts are frozen. They have become fixed in my mind. As I grow older, the images form into coherent islands, but they never lose that sense of fragmentation and dislocation. Life is full of islands, islands that all appear to be completely foreign lands in comparison to each, each other. Buchani, also smuggled out footage from a film called Chalka, Please Tell Us the Time, which was also released in 2017. I'm trying to get it for our library. Chalka is a bird on Manus, as well as being the name for the solitary confinement portion of the prison complex. Buchani continues to publish in many outlets and has helped allow the nameless asylum seekers across the world to enter representation. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's really quite an amazing story you're describing where politics, identity, and survival are all at play in a, in a rem, in remarkable individual and a remarkable text. And uh, it's, it's really quite extraordinary. Thank you again. So now I'd like to turn to uh, Phil Resnick, Professor of Political Science, also a poet. Uh, Phil has published many, many books, including 21st Century Democracy, The European Roots of Canadian Identity, and another title, The Labyrinth of North American Identities. But he's recently taken up autobiography, or perhaps memoir, and published this past uh, April, a volume entitled Itineraries, an intellectual odyssey. And so Phil, we'd like to hear a little bit more about the undertaking, what led you to write an autobiography and what did you learn in the process of doing it? Phil Resnick. Thanks, Ira, and good afternoon, everybody out there. You're out there somewhere. Um, about 15 years ago, I was having lunch with a, a late colleague of mine. Some of you probably will remember Alan Cairns. And he turned to me and said, Philip, you should write a memoir, your memoir. And I said, memoir? I don't think my life is all that exciting and interesting. Why would I want to write a memoir? 
Three years ago, I was heading down to Mexico for the first time. Uh, I was going to do the Mayan route, and I discovered in our library, oh yeah, this is a library you could still visit back then. Can you imagine? The, remember the library? The, the world of yesteryear. Anyway, uh, that Octavio Paz, the well-known Mexican poet and novelist uh, and essayist, had written uh, uh, essentially a memoir called Itineraries. And in it, this is what was interesting about it, he describes going as a young man to Yucatan, and then he was in Spain during the Civil War, and then he was in Paris after the Second World War, India. And as I read this, I said, well, that, that's a thematic memoir. Now, that would be more interesting than a personal, you know, a kind of strictly personal memoir. So that put the idea in my head that maybe I should pick up on Alan's suggestion of 15 years ago and do something with it. And I was heading off to Greece that uh, spring. Uh, I have to mention my late wife was Greek, and there's a you know, I have a direct connection with the country. And we have a, we have a, a rather nice writing spot, I must say, in a little cove on the Aegean at the bottom of Mount Pelion. We could go to worse places to do some writing. Anyway, I went off, and I I had also apropos the writing of memoirs. Over the years, I have kept a journal, not regularly, but enough that I had entries. So I pulled some of these together. And I also had the habit from time to time when you read a book or something of jotting down a passage or two that might, might you never know, you might want to come back and think about it. So I put some of these on my little laptop and off I went. And I thought this was going to be my, my summer project. And to my surprise, I actually had a draft. Uh, it was a shortened version of what was to come out in about three weeks. And in a sense, I realized, because I quote this towards the end of the memoir, uh, uh, Marcel Proust, at the very end of his long at la recherche du temps perdu, he says, you know, in the end, the novelist is he's really a translator of things that he's been carrying around inside. That's even more true, I think, for a memoir writer. So uh, I'll just put, a, 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 put it up for one second so people can see what it looks like. So this is the actual title. So it came out in late March, early April. We're going to have a launch for our department at Sage. Yeah, good luck, <laughs> given what, what, what has taken place this year. Uh, anyway, what I want to do then in the, in the few minutes I have left is very briefly take you through the, uh, the, the, the short sections that the book contains. The first one is called The Third Solitude. It picks up on the fact that I was born in Montreal in a world where we used to talk about the two solitudes, the French and the English, but there were lots of ethnic enclaves in between, and I was part of one of those, the Jewish one. And I briefly described that experience. I also described how, though I was brought up in a religious way, I, I, I lost my faith somewhere in my teenage years, have not looked back, but there's the historical and cultural connection, which is a little bit different than the purely religious. The second little section is called The Springtime of Peoples. And this is based on the fact that I entered McGill as an undergraduate in 1961. This was the beginning of the very early years of the Quiet Revolution in Quebec. So it's pretty hard to avoid the fact that nationalism was rearing its head. And it turned out that nationalism became one of the topics I really was very, very preoccupied with for the better part of my academic career. Quebec nationalism, Canadian nationalism, and I went on from there to also look at a number of other parallel kind of cases, what I would call multinational states like Spain, Belgium, and the United Kingdom. So the second section deals basically with my thoughts on nationalism. The third one is called Guises of the Left. Uh, I gravitated quite early in my life to, towards the, to the left of the political spectrum at McGill. The then the new left came along. I was quite involved with that when I was in Toronto. And in general, I have identified with that, but uh, this little section also examines towards the end some of the very serious challenges that the left faces today, because I have no illusions. There are very, very serious problems that it faces, and I, I try to at least work my way through with some possible ways so that one could get to move on. The fourth section is called European Reveries, and it talks about just how important Europe has been to my intellectual development. I had the good fortune to have spent it over over time, four years on very different occasions in Paris. So France became a very, very important source of, uh, I think, of intellectual nourishment. And through my marriage, uh, through my marriage, Greece became for me also something of a second home. So Europe has been a very, very important part of the story, which leads me to the fifth little section, which is called The Muse, How I Came to Write Poetry. It began in Montreal, and this will be of interest to Ira, because my high school teacher for English and history was a certain Irving Lake who was the mentor to a certain person I think you wrote a biography of. So I'm sure just mentioned it en passant. But uh, the other important source for me turned out to be Greece. And I write about that briefly in that section. 
The sixth little section is called Democracy and its Discontents. That's a topic that's very much uh, à la vogue, to put it mildly. We've just seen in the last two months the serious debates about the state of democracy in the Republic to the south of us. This past year has seen huge marches in countries as diverse as Algeria, the Sudan, Thailand, Hong Kong, or Belarus for democracy. It's something we really have to take very, very seriously, and I certainly do. The seventh section uh, is one which will be, I think, of interest to members of the college. It deals with academic freedom, some of the serious challenges which academic freedom historically has faced from the outside, religion, but intolerant versions of it, state, corporations, but also from within. But but that's a brief thing. The eighth section deals with Canadian identity and I, I focus on three key, key aspects of it. One is the fact that I think Canada is a multinational state. There's more than one group within the country which has a sense of national identity. The second is, is, that, is I, I, I go back to this little book I wrote years ago on the European roots that we, we had a stronger ongoing affinity with Europe than the Americans did. We didn't have a radical break with Europe, which they did. And this is true as much on the English Canadian as on the French Canadian or Quebecois side. And the third is our North American, as we are in North America, and there's no denying it, and that plays a very important role. The ninth little section is called West Coast Reflections. These are our thoughts about BC. I will be candid. I arrived here in 71, and I think it took about 30 years for me to really feel that this was home. It took a long, long time, but eventually it did happen. And sufficiently so that at the end of the section, I go through four different ways I think we can think about British Columbia. One is as a region unto itself. The second is part of something we can putatively call Cascadia. The third is as a version of California North. And the fourth is as part of something larger, which we can call Asia Pacific. So I, I, I briefly talk about each of those. The 10th uh, little section is called Explorations. Uh, we were all very fortunate, I think, uh, we in Maritime. We could travel and we had many opportunities to go abroad. Now, I'm not so sure what the current and younger generation is going to have given, given what's happening in the world of COVID. And uh, I write about six places where I spent some time, lectures, uh, conferences, uh, uh, visiting uh, sabbaticals and so on. Very briefly, the Soviet Union as it was then, Argentina, Germany, Spain, Art, uh, Australia, and Japan. And it's a little bit uh, much, and a little bit about the political culture and what that meant for me. Moving towards the finale, the, the end of this, the, the, the 11th section is called um, On the Passage of Time, something which, again, I think many of us in this college will be appreciative of since we are all at a stage in our lives where far more of our lives are behind us than ahead of us. So I look back, but I look back again in a more thematic and generational way, uh, not just a personal kind of way on, on, on some of the important uh, sort of events that took place and the impact and also things which impact more directly on one's own life. And finally, the last section, it's a short one, but it's called the question, I, I pose the question, it's one I think we could all pose, what was it all about? And I try to answer it by using a number of different sources, literary and others, and briefly to speak to them. And I conclude with a pronouncement which comes down to us from a very ancient source, but a very venerable one, the Delphic Oracle. And it's two little words, me then agon, which translates as Nothing in excess. And that's how I conclude my little memoir. Thank you. Very good. Very good. That makes me want to pack up my carry on bag and head to the airport after listening to this, which I know is improbable at this particular moment. This is great. Thank you, all three. So we have time now for a, a general discussion. Uh, before we address some questions from our audience, there are at the moment 69 people who are participating. Um, and perhaps I might uh, offer at least a general uh, question here because what all three of you have addressed are matters of form and how do you tell the story? And uh, Cheryl, you address that and Phil and Snedja in different ways. I'd like to hear a little bit more about the actual structure that you have selected, or the better question is, what structure worked best for you? So for example, Cheryl, did chronology become the method in which you organized the life, or did you do something like Phil, where you went to topics or themes? I, you have to. 
uh, have a chronology in a biography. I mean, it, it, that's the sort of spine or the skeleton that um, that holds things together. Uh, you have to know when when he was where, when your subject was uh, where, when, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, the, this is a, an essential component, and it's something you can't cheat on. You can't have your subject somewhere where they couldn't possibly be, for example. Uh, but once that, if you like, framework or underlying structure was in my hands and a chronology had been laid out and, and nailed down and corrected and verified and authenticated, all the things that you have to do, then it was a question of, well, all right, these are the bones, what about, where's the flesh and where's the person and how can I um, bring that person to life? So without giving too much away, um, I do not begin the biography at the beginning. I do go to the beginning eventually, but I do not begin there. And I explain my reasons in the introduction. Um, so there's a circularity, a repetition, if you will, or a circularity that is um, the shape of the story. And it contains, of course, it's, it's borne up, supported, on the facts of the chronology and other kinds of facts. But having written other biography, I would have to say that each subject, certainly in my case, Ira, has its own shape. And what worked for Finley would not be what would work for Pollock or somebody else, Mina Benson Hubbard, Tom, Tom Thompson. It, it, it comes out of the material and the insights that you have to work with. And I had a very definite reason in mind for not beginning at the beginning. And I, I, <laughs> yeah, no, I totally agree with you. I think it comes out of the life onto the page and in a way it's organic and you just seem, yeah, to discover what is the right shape for the storytelling. But Snedger with the refugee immigrant situation uh, you refer to islands as a kind of metaphor, right, in this particular autobiographical account, but is there something to unify the islands? Or if I may, are there bridges between these islands? Um, that's, that's the point, and that's why I chose uh, Buchani for very specific reasons, is that by its very nature, these are people who I, as I say, who are fighting, struggling to get into representation. So in a sense, they're, they're constantly that, that sense of having to struggle through preconceptions. Um, the quote about the islands comes from Buchani himself. Um, yes. And what's astonishing is that you keep feeling there's something very, there's an elusiveness, a lyricism, he's a poet, um, that you will never really apprehend. You, you'll just, it, it it's there, but you, you can only get a sense of it. So the fragmentation, the lack of clarity, because this is another culture, another language, um, in a sense, you see it all through a glass darkly. You know, there, there is that sense of you're only glimpsing something, which is part of it at the same time that you get this really strong realism because the, um, the details of what it's like to survive in a place like that come through very, very clearly. But in part, it's through taking um, for a shape, really, a much older form of literature, the, the kind that we associate with the medieval period, for example. And finally, I suppose you could say that this is very much, and he points to that, this is very much a collaborative enterprise by, again, by yeah. its nature. He himself is representing a whole community of people. And in turn, the text itself was shaped by the translators in association with him. So very different, very different. Yes, yes, I, I'm <laughs> beginning to understand it. I think it's great. And Phil, did you, before you had this conception of the thematic organization, were you thinking of this, of your account chronologically? Uh, did you, in other words, start in one form and then said, well, no, that's not really the story I want to tell. It shifted, the narrative changed, or at least the construction of the narrative. 
But no, no, there is a chronology to mine, but it's a little bit different from, I think, Cheryl's in the sense that each of these little sections has its own internal chronology. I mean, the, the third, you know, the third, uh, what do you call it? The, the, the third solitude is basically deals with that particular theme. And then there's the nationalist theme. And again, I start from my own beginning on this. So each one, except for the last one, has its own little mini chronology. And in a strange way, in a sense, I suppose each of these sections is like it's almost a self-contained vignette, so to speak, but they're, they are connected. So I'm not sure I had this, I didn't have the entire thing in mind when I began, but I, I, I definitely realized having read Paris, that's to say, because I did mention that was my inspiration, that this notion of doing this with themes was really something that intrigued me. And uh, in a sense, uh, picking up on something that, that uh, Snakes just said, I'm writing this, there's, you know, there's a personal side to it, and how can you write a memoir that isn't personal, but there's a sense in which I'm also writing something which is generational. I'm quite conscious of it. I came of age in the 60s, basically, and in some respect, I'm speaking not as a representative of the 60s, how, who can claim to be the representative of anything of that nature, but there is a sense in which it's generational, and that also, I think, uh, gives, uh, gives a certain kind of, um, um, what shall I say, a certain substance to the, to the entire project, or gave it to the entire project. Okay, thank you, that, that's helpful. So I'd like to go around very quickly one more time before we address some questions and ask each one of you, what did you have to leave out? What would you have liked to have added? Or if somebody said, you can each publish a little addendum to the work that you have done, what would you put in? Phil, I'll start with you. What did you well, leave out? Well, I could have put in more places I'd been to. I certainly could have gone on much longer on intellectual influences, good God, subjects like democracy and nationalism can go on forever in a day. Um, uh, maybe a little bit, having said that this was thematic, I could have had more points being a teeny bit more personal without turning it into an entirely personal kind of, and there are, there are bits which are like that, particularly the, the, 11, the, the, the second of the last one has, has much more personal things in it, including the sad business of death and the dying of those that are close to you. But I, I try to avoid it as much as possible, but in retrospect, maybe I could have been a little less uh, stingy on that score, okay? Okay. Snesha, were things left out? Absolutely. Um, really, in a sense, the happy ending, at least for the time being. And uh, in the associated material, I provided the link to a documentary made very recently by the ABC in Australia, which actually tells us that he managed, and it was quite, it was touch and go, managed to get a temporary visa to attend a, a festival in Christchurch in in. New Zealand, and that has oh. since become that he has been accepted as a permanent resident. Um, so mm -hmm. it was very precarious, um, and for the moment he's safe, and it'll be yeah. very interesting to me to see what sort of work he is able to produce from now on. Absolutely, mm. absolutely. And Cheryl, what did you leave out? Ah, uh, well, that's an interesting question. In my case, I had to struggle uh, with an editor to keep in certain things that were that she wanted out. And um, it came to the point where I just had to push back and say, no, it stays. Um, uh, several things pop into my mind, but just one, one example of this was to deal with Finley uh, and his, his uh, writing for the theater. When you introduced me, you, you mentioned that Finley was a playwright. Well, he was primarily a novelist not a primarily uh, a playwright, a prose writer, but he did write plays. He acted in the theater and that acting and that theater world influenced his prose and he talks about that. So I was very, very determined <laughs> that um, his life in the theater and his performativity of himself were absolutely essential. So I managed to get as much as I wanted, I think, in. What I, yeah. I couldn't get in, I suppose, and I wish now I had, and is something that grew with my work even more than what I said about his relevance today. I do say it, it's a thread in the, in the biography, but it's just, he was so prescient that it, when I think about it, it just makes my hair stand on end. He was warning, mm -hmm. he was warning humanity about so many of the things that we are facing now and not doing enough about. So could I have said more on those subjects? Uh, I try to stress it in interviews I'm giving. 
I, mm -hmm. I don't know. No. Yeah, yes, yeah. no, I understand completely. Uh, w. H. Auden said a book is never finished, it's abandoned. And when you say abandoned, there are all these other things that you want to put into it. Uh, let's move to a few questions from our participants. This is an interesting one from Linda Siegel. How is writing a memoir similar but also different to writing a biography? So who would like to address? Well, I'll, 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 I'll venture in and I'll say, I'll say something which I forgot to say earlier. Uh, in my academic career, I did all the, not so much archives, but the endless, you know, library searches and all that. And I have to say this, and I'm not in any way trying to give this, to slight my two, my two fellow participants in saying this, the liberation which comes from not having to use footnotes when you're writing a memoir, your own uh -huh. memoir. Oh my golly, the sense of liberation. <laughs> And that is the, greatest, is the greatest difference. You do not have to footnote your own stuff in the way you would if you're writing the biography of someone else. So that perhaps is the single most striking difference between the two. Okay, okay. Snedra, do, do you see a well, great difference? As, as, yeah, I do. Um, as someone who's part of a um, memoir writing group and you know who you are, um, all I can say is that in my, in my own versions of memoir writing, I use footnotes all the time. Sorry, Philip, <laughs> I do. Shaku oh, uh, songu, as they say. For, <laughs> for to each his own, or her own. For to all each kinds own. of reasons, yes. Okay. And Cheryl? Um, there is no difference at all insofar as, in the last analysis, they are both fictions. Huh? There are things that we make, that we shape out of the raw materials and the facts and the data that we have to work with. And I'm sure that Phil has repressed this and not gone into that subject in order to choose this other thing over here. Interestingly, in Finley's case, he wrote a brilliant memoir and I did suggest this is further reading. It's called Inside Memory. And um, it, it's an astonishing way of writing a memoir, I think, but it is very much a book, a story that is constructed. And I think that on the that level, at least, there's not much difference between the two. They are constructed stories. After that, um, well, I think you're much freer. Are you, Phil, when you're writing a memoir? It seems that Finley was much freer when he wrote Inside Memory. Uh, he does, in fact, say very little about himself as a person in the present and a lot about all the people he remembers. He's, mm -hmm. he's well, free. That's, that, yes, that's important because it is a beautiful transition to a question by Marjorie Fee. And Marjorie raises um, a very important subject, citizenship and the rights of citizens. And I'll read it. Hannah Arendt concludes human rights are in practice, if not in principle, not the natural rights of humans, qua humans, but the positive rights of citizens. So in all of the projects we've been discussing for the past hour, how does citizenship feature? Snedja, there's, there's a topic. Absolutely, and it's at the heart, it's totally at the heart of, of the memoir that I was talking about. Um, in another book that I'm reviewing at the moment, it uh, quotes Arendt as saying, um, you must almost, uh, the state must always keep its promises. And that's, that's part of the issue. How does the state keep its promises to citizens? And by, you know, by some um, tokens, I think you could say by creating non-citizens. And that's what we've been observing over the last few years, the creation of those categories of non-citizens. Uh, Judith Butler also has spoken a lot about this. And this is what is so hard for people who were stateless, like myself, um, to understand how that could be have such currency. Mm -hmm. And Cheryl, does it connect with what oh, you've been absolutely. saying about Finley's, you know, absolutely. sense of Canada, the yeah, future of the next? In ways. First off, Finley uh, was gay, as you know, so he uh, was considered at a, at a time when uh, homosexuality was illegal. Uh, so he uh, was treated as a non-person, as a person who didn't belong. Uh, and, and that would be the polite way, uh, as well as, of course, some, somebody, a pervert, criminal, etc., all sorts of horror stories. 
And as we know, if we're paying attention, this kind of prejudice and bigotry is still with us in this country and certainly is in other countries. But he um, became extremely, whether because of being gay uh, and experiencing uh, exclusions of that sort, or simply because it was his nature, uh, he uh, cared deeply and protested constantly about censorship and bigotry and felt it was the responsibility of the writer, of the artist to raise flags. And then it was our responsibility to pay attention. He says, pay attention over and over again, directly and metaphorically and stand up and act and resist uh, demagogues and authoritarianism and boy, are we dealing with it now. Okay, thank you. Phil, a natural well, topic for you. Well, it's a natural topic. To be honest, I quote Hannah Arendt at least two or three times in my little short memoir for various reasons. Above all, her, her really splendid book on the origins of totalitarianism, but also on her famous uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem uh, story. But on the citizenship thing, heavens, that is probably you know, so central to both questions of nationalism and national identity, and also, of course, to democracy in very powerful ways. In a way, it, it can bring things together. For example, Canada, thinking about it, and this has been my thinking about the, this country for a long time. We do have a shared citizenship, I think, in this country among the 38, 37 million, or however many we may be. But when it comes to national identity, to go back to that subject, I mean, let's face it, many First Nations people and many Quebecois do have a rather different sense of nationality than English-speaking Canadians generally but we have a shared citizenship. And that is, I think, a very important part of the story. On the democracy business, in a sense, the democracy is both very welcoming, but also we've seen it also be terribly intolerant towards minorities. We shouldn't have illusions about democracy always being uh, for the good and the virtuous. It can be quite the opposite, sadly. But it also is, uh, if we go back to the original, uh, the original Greek idea, and it has not really changed, after all, democracy was for the citizens. And as we know, not everybody in ancient Athens was a citizen. And we see many countries around the world today where significant sections of the population are second and third class citizens rather than first class citizens. So that's an ongoing issue, which even democratic states can have problems with. But it's, it's central at the same time to the whole notion of the people. The people are usually thought of in terms of the citizens. So that is, you know, certainly is a very, very important concept in, as important today as it was way back in Greek or Roman times. Okay, excellent, thank you, thank you. We're just about running out of time, but I do have one final question that's been put to us and a short answer will be fine. And here's the question, how do you discipline yourself to keep at it? Writing can be a terribly lonely and lengthy procedure. Cheryl, how do you keep at it, especially with a big project like Finley? You mentioned the number of years, I won't repeat them, that you've been involved with it. Well, you make a commitment, don't you? Uh, you make a commitment in many ways. I made a commitment to um, Bill Whitehead, who, as the family, had to give me access or deny me access to archives and restricted materials. And he was marvelous. He never interfered. And he opened doors and gave written permission for me to see anything and everything. So you make a commitment to another human being. Then you make a commitment to the people who are funding your research. So that um, I had to do some things that were rather mm, naughty or probably I shouldn't have done, but I was in those places on the taxpayer's dime, on your dime, Ira and I wasn't gonna walk away. You make a commitment. And then of course you make a commitment to the ongoing physical task of writing, but I think it ruined my back. Oh, I see. Sneja, how do you keep doing it? Um, well, um, I think one of the things it's done of course is uh, absolutely disciplined us to go through this period now where everyone is in a sense um, isolated and having to find ways to keep busy. So one of the things, it's always been that, it's always been the place to go to keep yourself together. And, and it comes in very handy at the moment. <laughs> I understand entirely. Phil? Well, in my case, 
Well, I can cheat because I actually always had or have had a second interest. So the academic, when I was, you know, the academic years, my God, I also had my, my seven year projects and my three or four year projects. But one of the joys, and since I've retired, this is even more true, uh, of course, of poetry is you write a poem and you don't have to spend 20 years, well, unless you're writing the Yiddish or something like that, well, that can go on forever or, or some equivalent. And hence, one can basically write things which, in fact, are much shorter in terms of the time span required. And that makes it a lot, a lot easier. So that's the kind of writing I've been doing much more of in the last five or six years. So, uh, Phil, do you feel slightly liberated because you're writing without footnotes? Does this give you a new kind of freedom and energy? Well, to be honest, I do, I do feel that. I felt that with the memoir, but also just, yeah, again, I mean, well, sometimes mind your poems will be inspired by a passage and also, you know, there's a little epigraph at the beginning of it, which, get, which gets you going. So it's not, there is a kind of hidden footnote sometimes, but you don't call them footnotes, you call them epigraph. You, call, you, you give them another name and they're, and they're more legitimate. But no, there is, there is that freedom which comes in fact from knowing it's, it's something which can't, you know, I wouldn't call it instant gratification, but something which can be put onto the page or typed up, if that's what you're doing, rather quickly. And, and it's not something which has to go on forever. This is not, again, to put down for one second the serious business of academic scholarship or, bi or the writing of biographies, but there is a liberation. I will not deny it. Well, I, th I think this has been a spectacular conversation. We've moved all the way from archives and footnotes to autobiographies and personal expressions and representation. We could spend another hour and a half talking about issues of representation and especially the phrase that uh, Cheryl used early on, kind of bringing life to the page and somehow providing some sense of the exuberance and the dilemmas of the various individuals that we've chosen to write about, even ourselves in the case of autobiography. So again, I'd like to thank everyone for participating, Snedja, Phil, Cheryl. I think this has been a terrific conversation and I hope that our audience is stimulated to read the works that our participants have uh, written, but also to go off and read biography and autobiography and even dare I say history as well. So thank you all and thanks to our participants I think it's been a terrific conversation. I look forward to many, many more. I think I'll turn things over to Sandra Van Ark and I'd like to thank her as well as Graham. So thank you to our audience. Sandra, I think you may want to make a couple of announcements. Yeah, I just want to draw your attention to the next conversation, uh, which is planned to happen in January. Uh, we have the speakers and a moderator. Uh, we'll send you updated information once we have a date that we will hold a meeting. Um, and the other two conversations um, will be put together, are put together as we speak right now, and we'll give you more information on that, and it's available on our website. So that's it. And I think we'll end this meeting right now. And uh, thank you all for attending. Um, I will post a video on the website this week and you'll get a link as well. Thank you.